pain for this person. Um, one of the more standard therapies for hepatitis C is interferon. And very clearly, not only will the side effects of interferon be made more tolerable in light of good glutathione levels, but the interferon itself will have a better efficacy. There's a number of studies that show that if you're going to use interferon, raising glutathione levels is an excellent idea. Thank you. Yes, sir. I'm in a homocysteine and Uh, to raise glutathione, we're trying to deliver cysteine to the cell. Why not just eat cysteine? The free amino acid cysteine itself carries a certain toxicity, and if you flood the system with too much of it at once, you can get into a situation called um, uh, uh, hypersystemia. Hyper Thank you, Jim. Jim knows I've been traveling. And which is actually a pro-oxidant state. And so you're totally getting away with what you're trying to do. What is there another amino acid that can deliver cysteine to the cell? Amino acid called methionine. Why don't we eat huge amounts of methionine? Why don't you recommend that to your patients? Because methionine is also an excellent precursor for homocysteine, which most of you know homocysteine is a... Um, being recognized as a significant risk factor for the development of cardiac disease. And I can refer you to some articles, uh, I think it's by Stamler, who looks at the balance between cysteine, homocysteine, and glutathione. And you remember the, the arrows that we used to use in high school uh, chemistry and biochemistry. The more this is shifted towards glutathione, the more shifted away from homocysteine. And I have a great article for you to look at if you, if you can read the biochemistry and not go to sleep in three minutes. Um, took me about a month to read, but it's, uh, it really explains it in, in, in great detail. Yes, ma'am. How is the protein glutathione discovered? Well, you missed the beginning. Oh, that's right. Well, no, how, how we discovered this protein, but, no, but glutathione itself, uh, the tripeptide glutathione, we've known about glutathione probably for 80, 90 years now. Uh, some of the first scientists, some of the first physicians that knew about glutathione were actually ophthalmologists, uh, recognizing the importance of glutathione as an antioxidant in the lens of your eye. Uh, and the <coughs> lens of your eye, as you know, is not a lens like this. It's uh, just a clear bag of liquid protein, uh, which is very, very prone to becoming oxidized. And uh, when it becomes oxidized, it makes the protein cloudy and you develop a cataract. Now, when I first started working with this product, I, I, one of my tasks was to answer phone calls from, from uh, uh, medical people in the field. And I would get in the beginning about a number of phone calls saying, Dr. Gubbin, you know, since I've been using this, um, I, I see better. So I figured, okay, these people are local or it's a... Uh, some sort of placebo effect, but I kept on getting the same story and I went back and, and looked at my notes. Inevitably, these people were between the ages of 40 and 60. This is when we first start to develop cataracts. It's not until we're about 70 or 75 where they're dense enough to be called and have something done about it. And what these people were experiencing was early cataract reversal. And so we, we did some more research, which is a good reason to pay attention to anecdotes because they, although they don't carry any statistical relevance, they, they tell you where to look. And we've got people who've told us, you know, they, they go to their, their eye doctor and the eye doctor looks at them and looks at the chart, looks at them and looks at the chart again, can't figure out what's going on because you're not supposed to see reversal of cataracts. So the ophthalmologists were... Yes, ma'am. Oh, sorry. Yeah, I wanted to ask you uh, how any of this would relate to or help. Any um, there's not a lot of uh, literature on sarcoidosis, although I'm trying to put together a little package on sarcoidosis, and it will take me a couple. I will take advantage of you using your question to talk about many of these type of diseases. A lot of them are considered autoimmune phenomena. And if Dr. Gutman is saying that this is fuel for the immune system, can we not potentially take somebody with an autoimmune disease and make them sicker? 
I try to teach people about autoimmune disease, I try to get them to understand it's not simply the immune system attacking the own body. Let's look at the two of the most common autoimmune diseases, lupus and rheumatoid arthritis. When you look at these very carefully, you notice that there's an overactivity of one group of cells called B-cell lymphocytes and a different kind of activity in the T-cell lymphocytes. And when you put glutathione into the system, you're actually regulating the two, you're balancing the two. So I try to get people to appreciate that autoimmune disease very often is an immune imbalance. And in the cases of, uh, of lupus and rheumatoid arthritis, uh, very clearly uh, you end up with less inflammation, less pain, and an overall better clinical effect. Another autoimmune disease that, uh, that is addressed very well by, by raising glutathione would be multiple sclerosis. Uh, the mechanism there is different. Uh, in MS patients, there's a breakdown of uh, something called myelin, which is a coating around the nerves. Um, this myelin, because it's a fat, is very prone to the oxidation of fats, lipid peroxidation. The main biochemistry that we have in our body to prevent the oxidation of fat is a chemical called glutathione peroxidase. And by raising glutathione levels, you raise glutathione peroxidase, and you're able to prevent some of the damage done with a myelin sheath in, a, in an MS patient. So the main, you really have to look at the nitty gritty of, of, of the mechanisms going on. How many more questions do you think we should take? Mm -hmm. Don't you, Terry? Yeah, you should stand. No. Well, no, we no, did. No. Go ahead, one more. <laughs> yeah. if, uh, will this product make vitamin E or vitamin C obsolete then? Absolutely not. Um, just like I think it's crazy for people to say you only should be eating proteins or you shouldn't only be eating fats or you should only talk to your wife and not hang with your buddies. <laughs> we need all of this stuff. Okay? And if you changed your question and said, Dr. Gutman, if you were stuck on a desert island and you only had one supplement to take, Yes, I would take a glutathione precursor. <clears throat> but glutathione works with vitamin E and vitamin C and, and, and A. It, uh, it's important with a number of the, the, the B vitamins are involved in the, the uh, uh, regulation of its uh, energy. Uh, folate is important. Selenium is critical. So we need all of this stuff. There is a lot of supplements that I wouldn't touch with a 10-foot pole. But some, I mean, what, what you're mentioning is basic... Uh, uh, Vitamins, absolutely. Like I would continue to using them. Yes. Um, my 14-year-old daughter developed a Bell's palsy, and um, I know the etiology of Bell's is still much of a mystery. And I worry about a reoccurrence. She's 16 now, and she's been taking the Unical. Um, just, I think to make herself feel like if there's anything you can do, you try to do anything. And uh, I was just wondering if there's any studies on that. And also, completely different as the peripheral neuropathy, which is okay. another okay. um, In the case of Bell's, usually it's, once you get over Bell's, you, you're, you're over it. Uh, unfortunately, about 20% of um, people who have Bell's palsy are gonna have some long-term sequela. Um, I haven't seen any formal studies done in Bell's. Uh, but I know that if it was my patient or me or my child, I, I would try to jump on this at the very outset, the very outset. Because although we don't know the complete pathophysiology behind Bell's, it's, it's obviously an immune phenomenon. Um, so I can't really help you too much there. In regards to peripheral neuropathy, well, the, the most common peripheral neuropathy that we see these days is a diabetic peripheral neuropathy. And uh, I can show you studies where people have done nerve conduction studies uh, before and after glutathione. Uh, it, it, this, is, this is something that I think is going, you're going to see a lot of in the future. And for any diabetic, uh, anybody with heart disease, anybody with history of stroke, anybody who's a smoker, anybody who has high cholesterol, the common thread over there is uh, problems with the circulation. And, um, the way this works is, for example, this person who has a, a neuropathy, it's because of the circulation is affected to the peripheral nerves, in the case of diabetes. And what's going on is fats like cholesterol, triglycerides, when they become oxidized, it changes in biochemically and it renders them stickier, so they end up gumming up your arteries. It's a layman's explanation. 
Again, it's glutathione peroxidase that stops lipid peroxidation. Glutathione peroxidase will slow down the oxidation of these fats like cholesterol. So that if you have a cholesterol level of 700 and I have a cholesterol level of 700, but you have a lot of glutathione, you are far more protected from the long-term consequences of cardiovascular and circulatory disease. So anybody who's uh, on that list has to look at this strategy carefully. I, I, I wish, we'll take one more from the back from my good friend Jim, um, but um, if you need more information, there are people in this room that can get you information. There's information on the web. Um, I'm going to take this opportunity to selfishly promote my own book. Um, most of the answers can be found here. Um, this will be online soon. Um, your health is the most important thing that you have and your patients have. Uh, I'm standing up here giving a lecture. Please keep in mind that I'm promoting a product, so you have to take everything that I say with a grain of salt. Get on the internet, crack open your books, do your homework, and when you find out about glutathione, you will be 100% convinced that this is what you should be recommending to people. Oh, Jim, I almost forgot your question. I just saw the latest statistics from the uh, CDC on chronic pulmonary problems with regards to asthma. It says there's 20.6 million Americans with it, which is about one out of every 15 people. So uh, what would this huge amount of people benefit by raising food? Oh, boy. You know, this, there's so many areas, Jim. We didn't talk about kidney disease. We didn't talk about the role in athletes. We didn't talk about neurodegenerative diseases like Parkinson's. I'm going to write a paper on that. So there's so many, so many areas uh, that we could, we could spend a week here. Uh, certainly with uh, pulmonary obstructive disease like asthma, bronchitis, and emphysema, uh, chronic bronchitis, um, doctors in Europe have been raising glutathione for 20, 25 years. It's just catching on now. Uh, and North American doctors have been raising glutathione in the case of cystic fibrosis because it's a mucolytic. It breaks down mucus in these kids. But um, the application is, is tremendous in COPD. Tremendous in COPD. And these are some of the people that will respond quickest, and especially in the pediatric population. Thank you very much for your attention. Okay, thanks, Dr. Gunnell. We appreciate it. Introduce a good friend of ours, and he travels the United States. He's a representative of Aminotech Research. He talks to all sorts of group, and now you've learned about glutathione. Dr. Gunnell talked a little bit about what we can do about it. Uh, we're going to introduce Jim Spencer, a national spokesman, travels around quite a bit, and he's going to uh, talk to you about Immunitec and Immunocal. Uh, Mr. Spencer. I don't know about you, but I think I could listen several more hours to Dr. Gutman. He, uh, he's amazing. And uh, I was over at his house in uh, Montreal about a year ago. Yeah, turn it on. Transform. Yeah. Do you want? Oh, yeah. Somebody unplugged it? No. Was it me? Who unplugged that? You did. There is a little button that you just got to press. I didn't unplug it. I must have kicked it. It wasn't intentional, I promise. No, I unplugged it. Oh, you unplugged it. But, uh, you got to plug that other cord in there. Oh, okay. Plug the black one. Well, everything's unplugged. He unplugged it because it was speaking to Test. There you go. Okay. I don't have a business. Uh, as I was mentioning, I was over at Dr. Gutman's um, house, and uh, he has an office that he keeps uh, uh, inside of the house, and uh, it's probably about maybe one third of the size of this room. And you've all seen the little pigeon holes where people keep papers and documents. The entire office hundreds and hundreds of these little pigeonholes. And I said, what in the world is... He said, these are... This is the largest collection of clinical studies on glutathione in the world. <laughs> and he's read every one of them. So it was amazing that he was able to take all that information, filter it down, and put it into, really, for the first time, uh, a publication that allows us to actually have a breakdown by disorder. There's about uh, three or 400 pages but over 2,000 clinical studies that have been actually earmarked. So if um, you want to know what it does for exercise and physical performance, 
at the end of the chapter, there's all the clinical studies on it. If you turn to uh, the, uh, the studies done on lung disease, after the article, there's pages of clinical studies done on the lung disease. So it's very, very well documented. It's something we sorely needed because we didn't have anything like that. And frankly, um, it took about eight years of private investigation and funding to conclude the research on the Immunocal product before it was released to the general public. In 1988, Immunotech Research as a company was formed, and $10 million were spent in the first six or seven years just to complete the funding uh, on the research. And in 1996, uh, a group of five patents, it's now been increased to seven, there's now seven pharmaceutical patents have been awarded Immunocal in North America, both in Canada and the United States. The interesting thing about these patents are they are method of use pharmaceutical patents. They're not patents on a formula. Now, formulas are very simple patents and very inexpensive patents to get. You can just tweak something a little bit this way or that way and you can get another formula. But a pharmaceutical patent deals with the intellectual property what the stuff does and the concepts and what arrived at that technology. And so Dr. Bunos's research stems all the way back to 1978. So we're now in our approximately 25th year of working with this, with this science. And imagine it was just an accidental discovery. It was not, it was not something he even intended to, uh, to uncover or establish. He was working on something completely different uh, and by association, he was able to uncover it. This is very similar to what happened with penicillin. You might remember that a doctor forgot to wash his plates, and he went on vacation, and he came back to a messy lab, and that's how he discovered penicillin. And it was a fungus. It was a, it was a growth. And he just happened to have the wits to recognize that the growth was pushing back bacteria away from the plate. Otherwise, if he hadn't have noticed it, he would have washed it, who knows if we ever would have discovered penicillin. That's how accidental it was. But you know what? It took 22 years from that moment until penicillin was finally released to the general public. And two years later, it was given the Nobel Prize for Medicine. And five years later, every doctor on the planet was using penicillin. Isn't that interesting? So it's about the same time frame that has taken glutathione's technology to come to the forefront. Now, I'll tell you how that's uh, been amplified. It's been amplified in the last seven years because the company became a marketing tool for Immunitech Research Limited, and we began to offer it to the general public beginning in 1997. In fact, it was a little small room like this in uh, Montreal where they first had Dr. Bunos talk to a group of... Uh, of people about it, and they said, listen, we'd like your help. We'd like to, to educate the general public. And from that moment on, we've been educating ever since. Men like Dr. Bunos uh, have expanded to men like Dr. Uh, uh, Jimmy Gutman, uh, Dr. Somersall, Dr. Iwama, and maybe some of you doctors in here also will join our efforts because <clears throat> it's not something that happens overnight. In fact, Dr. Gutman says that uh, the medical profession, pardon the expression, is very similar to an elephant. It takes a lot to get it to move. <laughs> but once you get it moving, it takes a lot to stop it. And so that's what is happening. The doctor